A man belonging to a local regiment, a man stationed here, a soldier on his way home for a visit, a soldier going for a drink in town, a scout. Her sense of alarm rose. A scout? What would he be a scouting man for in his own regiment? Man. The man, man stationed here, a, low dark a soldier on his... I don't know. I was only wondering if you knew anything of him. No, of course not. I just found him. Are these Daharan soldiers dangerous? I mean, do they bother folks? Folks just traveling through? Her gaze fled his questioning mm. eyes. I... I don't know. I guess they could be. She feared to say too much, but she wouldn't want him to end up in trouble because she said too little. What do you suppose a lone mm. soldier was doing way out here? Soldiers aren't often alone. I don't know. Why do you suppose a simple woman would know more about soldiering than a man of the world who travels about? Don't you have any ideas of your own? Maybe he was just on his way home for a visit or something. Maybe he was thinking about a girl back home, and so he wasn't paying attention like he should have been. Maybe that's why he slipped and fell. He rubbed his neck again, as if he were in pain. I'm sorry. I guess I'm not making much sense. I'm a little tired. Maybe I'm not thinking clearly. Maybe I was only concerned for you. For me? What do you mean? I mean that soldiers belong to units of one sort or another. Other soldiers know them and know where they're supposed to be. Soldiers don't just go off alone when they want to. They aren't like some lone trapper who could vanish and no one would know. Or some lone traveler? An easy grin softened his expression. Or some lone traveler. The grin withered. The point is, other soldiers will likely look for you. If they come upon his body here, they'll bring in troops to prevent anyone from leaving the area. Once they gather anyone they can find, they'll start asking questions. From what I've heard about the Haran soldiers, they know how to ask questions. They'll want to know every detail about every person they question. Jensen's middle cramped in sick, churning consternation. The last thing in the world she wanted was to harren soldiers asking questions of her or her mother. This dead soldier could end up being the death of them. But what are the chances? I'm only saying that I'd not like to have this fellow's friends come along and decide that someone has to pay for his death. They might not see it as an accident. Soldiers get stirred up by the death of a comrade, even if it was an accident. You and I are the only two around. I'd not like to have a bunch of soldiers discover him and decide to blame us. You mean even if it was an accident, they might seize an innocent person and blame them for it? I don't know. But in my experience, that's the way soldiers are. When they're angry, they find someone to blame. But they can't blame us. You weren't even here, and I was only going to tend my fishing lines. He planted an elbow on his knee and leaned over the dead man toward her. And this soldier, going about his business for the Great Taharan Empire, saw a beautiful young woman strutting along and was so distracted by her that he slipped and fell. I wasn't strutting. I don't mean to suggest you were. I only meant to show you how people can find blame when they decide they want to. She'd not thought of that. They were Daharan soldiers. Such behavior would hardly be out of the question. The rest of what he'd said registered in her mind. Jensen had never before had a man call her beautiful. It flustered her, coming so unexpectedly and out of place as it did in the middle of such a worry. Since she didn't have any idea how to react to the compliment, and since there were so many more important thoughts commanding her emotions, she ignored it. If they find him, the man said, then at the least they're going to collect anyone around and question them long and hard. All the ugly implications were becoming all too real. The day of doom was suddenly looming near. What do you think we should do? He thought it over a moment. Well, if they do come by, but don't find him, then they won't have any reason to stop and question the people here. If they don't find him, they'll go somewhere else to keep looking for him. He rose and looked around. Ground's too hard to dig a grave. He pulled his hood farther forward to shield his eyes from the mist as he searched. He pointed to a spot near the base of the cliff. There. There's a deep cleft that looks big enough. We could put him in there and cover him over with gravel and rocks. Best burial we can manage this time of year. And probably more than he deserved. She would just as soon leave him, but that wouldn't be wise. Covering him up was what she had planned on doing before the stranger happened along. This would be a better way to do it. There would be less chance that animals would uncover him for passing soldiers to discover. Seeing her trying to hastily weigh the various ramifications and mistaking it for reluctance, he spoke in soft assurance. The man is dead. Nothing can be done about it. It was an accident. Why let that accident bring trouble? We didn't do anything wrong. We weren't even here when it happened. I say we bury him and go on with our lives, without Daharan soldiers becoming unjustly involved. Jensen stood. The man might be right about soldiers coming upon a dead friend and deciding to question people. There was abundant reason to be worried about the dead Daharan soldier without this new concern. She thought again about the piece of paper she'd found in his pocket. That would be reason enough, without any other. If the piece of paper was what she thought it might be, then questioning would only be the beginning of the ordeal. Agreed, she said. If we're to do it, let's be quick. He smiled, more relief than anything, she thought. Then, turning to face her more squarely, he pushed his hood back off his head, the way men did out of respect for a woman. Jensen was shocked to see, even though he was at most only six or seven years older than she, that his cropped hair was as white as snow. She gazed at him with much the same sense of wonder as people gaze at her red hair. With the shadows of the hood gone, she saw that his eyes were as blue as hers, as blue as people said her father had been. The combination of this short white hair and those blue eyes was erect. The way they both went with his clean-shaven face was singularly clear. It all fit together with his features in a way that seemed completely right. He held his hand out across the dead soul. My name is Sebastian. She hesitated a moment, but then offered her hand in return. Even though his was big and no doubt powerful, he didn't squeeze her with his features in a way that seemed completely right. He held his hand out across the dead soldier. My name is Sebastian. She hesitated a moment, but then offered her hand in return. Even though his was big and no doubt powerful, he didn't squeeze her hand to prove it, the way some men did. The unnatural warmth of the hand surprised her. Are you going to tell me your name? I'm Jensen Daggett. Jensen. He smiled his pleasure at the sound of it. She felt her face going red again. Instead of noticing, he immediately set to the task by grabbing the soldier under his arms and giving him a tug. The body moved only a short distance with each mighty pull. The soldier had been a huge man. Now he was a huge dead weight. Jensen seized the soldier's cloak at the shoulder to help. 
Sebastian moved his hold to cloak at the other shoulder, and together they dragged the weight of the man, who loomed as dangerous to her in death as he would have in life, across the gravel and slick patches of smooth rock. Still panting from the effort, and before pushing the soldier into the crevice that was to be his final resting place, Sebastian rolled him over. Jensen saw for the first time that he wore a short sword strapped over his shoulder under his pack. She hadn't seen it before because he was lying. Hooked on the weapon's belt around his waist, the small of his back, hung a crescent-bladed battle axe. Jensen's level of apprehension rose at seeing how heavily armed the soldier had been. Regular soldiers didn't carry this many weapons, or a knife as he had. Sebastian tugged the straps of the pack down off the arms. He unstrapped the short sword and set it aside. He pulled off the weapon's belt and tossed it across the sword. Nothing too unusual in the pack, he said after a brief inspection. He added the pack to the short sword, the weapon's belt, and the axe. Sebastian started searching the dead man's pockets. Jensen was about to question what he was doing when she recalled that she had done the same. She was somewhat more disturbed when he returned the other items after picking out the money. She thought it rather cold-blooded, stealing from the dead. Sebastian held the money out to her. What are you doing, she asked. Take it. He offered the money again more insistently this time. What good is it going to do in the ground? Money is of use to relieve the suffering of the living, not the dead. You think the good spirits will ask him for the price of a bright and pleasant eternity? He was a Daharan soldier. Jensen expected the keeper of the underworld would have something somewhat more dark in store for this man's eternity. But it's not mine. He frowned a reproving look. Consider it partial compensation for all you've suffered. She felt her flesh go cold. How could he know? They were always so careful. What do you mean? The year is taken off your life by the fright this fellow gave you today. Jensen finally was able to let her breath go in a silent sigh. She had to stop fearing the worst in what people said. She allowed Sebastian to put the coins in her hand. All right, but I think you should have half for helping me. She handed three gold marks back. He grasped her hand with his other and pressed all three coins into her palm. Take it, it's yours now. Jensen thought of what this much money could mean. She nodded. My mother has had a hard life. She could use it. I will give it to my mother. I hope it helps you both then. Let it be this man's last good act, helping you and your mother. Your hands are warm. By the look in his eyes, she thought she knew why. She said no more. He nodded and confirmed her suspicion. I've got a touch of fever. I came down with it this morning. When we get finished with this business, I'm hoping to get to the next town and rest up in a dry room for a while. I just need some rest to regain my strength. Town is too far for you to make today. You sure? I can make good time. I'm used to traveling. So am I, Jensen said, and it takes me most of the day to make it. There's only a couple of hours of light left, and we have yet to finish with this task. Not even a fast horse would get you near town today. Sebastian let out a sigh. Well, I guess I'll make do. He knelt again and rolled the soldier partway over in order to unstrap the knife. The sheath, fine grain black leather, was trimmed with silver to match the handle and decorated with the same ornate emblem. On one knee, Sebastian held the gleaming sheathed knife up to her. Silly to bury such a fine weapon. Here you go. Better than that piece of junk you showed me before. Jensen stood stunned and confused. But you should keep it. I'll take the others. More to my taste, anyway. The knife is yours. Sebastian's rule. Sebastian's rule? Beauty belongs with beauty. Jensen blushed at the intended compliment. But this was not a thing of beauty. He had no idea of the ugliness this represented. Any idea what the R in the hilt stands for? Oh, yes, she wanted to say. She knew only too well what it represented. That was the ugliness. It stands for the House of Ra. House of Ra? Lord Ra, the ruler of the Hara, she said, in simple explanation of a nightmare. Chapter 3. By the time they were finished with the laborious task of covering the troublesome body of the dead Daharan soldier, Jensen's arms were weak with fatigue. The damp wind scything through her clothes felt like it cut to the bone. Her ears and nose and fingers were numb. Sebastian's face was covered in a sheen of sweat. But the dead man was at last buried under gravel and then rocks that were in abundance at the base of the cliff. Animals were not likely to be able to dig through all the heavy stone to get at the body. The worms would feast undisturbed. Sebastian had said a few simple words, asking the creator to welcome the man's soul into eternity. He made no plea for mercy in his judgment, and neither did Jensen. As she finished scattering gravel with a heavy branch at her feet, obscuring the marks left by their work, she gave the area a critical examination and was relieved to see that no one would ever suspect that a person lay buried there. If soldiers came through, they wouldn't realize that one of their own had met his end here. They would have no reason to question local people, except perhaps to ask if anyone had seen him. That would be a simple enough lie to feed them, and one easily swallowed. Jensen pressed her hand against Sebastian's forehead. It confirmed her fears. You're burning with fever. We're done now. I can rest more easily, not having to worry that soldiers will be rousting me out of my bedroll to ask me questions at the point of the sword. She wondered where he was going to sleep. The drizzle was thickening. She expected it would soon be raining. Given the persistence of the darkening clouds, once it started, it would likely rain the whole night. Cold rain soaking him to the skin would only further inflame his fever. Such a winter rain could easily kill someone who lacked proper shelter. She watched as Sebastian strapped the weapons belt around his waist. He didn't place the axe at the small of his back the way the soldier had worn it, but rather positioned it at his right hip. After testing its edge and finding it satisfactory, he fastened the short sword to the left side of the belt. Both weapons were placed so as to come readily to hand. When he'd finished, he flipped his heavy green cloak and closed over it all. He seemed again a simple trap. He expected to do more. He had his secrets. He wore them casually, almost in the open. She wore hers uneasily and held close. He handled the sword with the kind of smooth ease that came only with long acquaintance. She knew because she handled a knife with effortless grace, and such proficiency had come only with experience and continual practice. Some mothers taught their daughters to sew and cook. Jensen's mother didn't think sewing would save her daughter. Not that a knife would either, but it was better protection than needle and thread. Sebastian lifted the dead man's pack and threw back the flap. We'll divide the supplies. You want the pack? You should keep the supplies in the pack, Jensen said, as she retrieved her stringer of fish. He agreed with a nod. He appraised the sky as he cinched the pack closed. I'd best be on my way then. Where? 
His weary eyelids blinked at the question. No place special, traveling. I guess I'll walk for a while, and then I suppose I'd better try to find some shelter. Rain is coming, she said. It doesn't take a profit to tell that. He smiled. Guess not. His eyes bore the prospect of what lay ahead with resigned acceptance. He swiped his hand back over his wet spikes of white hair, then pulled up his hood. Well, take care of yourself, Jensen Daggett. Give my best to your mother. She raised a lovely daughter. Jensen smiled and acknowledged his words with a single nod. She stood, facing the damp wind as she watched him turn and start off across the flat expanse of gravel. Craggy rock walls rose up all around, their snow-crusted boulders disappearing into the low gray overcast that concealed the bulk of the mountains and the nearly endless range of high peaks. It seemed so funny, so freakish, so futile, that in all this vast country their paths should cross so briefly, at that instant in time, for such a tragic moment as one life ended, and then that they would both go off again into that infinite oblivion of life. Jensen's heart pounded in her ears as she listened to his footsteps crunching across the jagged gravel, watched his long strides carrying him away. With a sense of urgency, she debated what she should do. Was she always to turn away from people? To hide? Was she always to forfeit even small snatches of what it was to live life because of a crime she did not commit? Dare she risk this? She knew what her mother would say, but her mother loved her dearly, and so would not say it out of cruelty. Sebastian? He looked back over his shoulder, waiting for her to speak. If you don't have shelter, you may not live to see tomorrow. I wouldn't like it if I knew you were out here with a fever getting soaked to the skin. He stood watching her, the drizzle drifting between them. I wouldn't like that either. I'll mind your words and do my best to find some shelter. Before he could turn away again, she lifted her hand, gesturing off in the other direction. She saw that her fingers were trembling. You could come home with me. Would your mother mind? Her mother would be in a panic. Her mother would never allow a stranger, despite what help he had been, to sleep in the house. Her mother wouldn't sleep awake all night with a stranger anywhere near. But if Sebastian stayed out with a fever, he could die. Jensen's mother would not wish that on this man. Her mother had a kind heart. That loving concern, not malice, was the reason she was so protective of Jensen. The house is small, but there's room in the cave where we keep the animals. If you wouldn't mind, you could sleep there. It's not as bad as it sounds. I've slept there myself on occasion when the house felt too confining. I'd make you a fire near the entrance. You'd be warm and could get the rest you need. He looked reluctant. Jensen held up her stringer of fish. We could feed you, she said, sweetening the offer. You would at least have a good meal along with a warm rest. I think you need both. You helped me. Let me help you. His smile, one of gratitude, returned. You're a kind woman, Jensen. If your mother will allow it, I will accept your offer. She lifted her cloak open, displaying the fine knife in its sheath, which she had tucked behind her belt. We'll offer her the knife. She will value it. His smile, warm and suddenly lighthearted with amusement, was as pleasant a smile as Jensen had ever seen. I don't think two knife-wielding women need lose any sleep over a stranger with a fever. That was Jensen's thought, but she didn't admit it. She hoped her mother would see it that way, too. It's settled then. Come along before the rain catches us out. Sebastian trotted to catch up with her as she started out. She lifted the pack from his hand and shouldered it. With his own pack and his new weapons, he had enough to carry in his weakened condition. Chapter 4 Wait here, Jensen said in a low voice. I'll go tell her that we have a guest. Sebastian dropped heavily onto a low projection of rock that made a convenient seat. You just tell her what I said, that I'll understand if she doesn't want a stranger spending the night at your place. I know it wouldn't be an unreasonable fear. Jensen considered him with a calm and somber demeanor. My mother and I have reason not to fear a visitor. Then I'm as safe as a babe in his mother's arms. Jensen left Sebastian to wait on the rock while she made her way up the winding path, through sheltering spruce, using twisted roots as steps up, toward her house set back in a clutch of oak on a small shelf in the side of a mountain. The flat patch of grassy ground was, on a better day, a sunny open spot among the towering old trees. There was room enough to yard their goat along with some ducks and chickens. Steep rock to the back prevented any visitors happening upon them from that direction. Only the path up the front provided an approach. Should they be threatened, Jensen and her mother had constructed a well-hidden set of footholds up the back to a narrow ledge and out a twisting sideway via deer paths that would take them through a ravine and away. The escape route was nearly inaccessible as a way in, unless you knew the precise course through the maze of rock walls, fissures, and narrow ledges, and even then, they had made certain that key passages were well hidden by strategically placing dead wood and brush they'd planted. Ever since Jensen was young, they had moved often, never staying in one place too long. Here, though, where they felt safe, they had stayed for over two years. Travelers had never discovered their mountain hideaway, as sometimes had happened in other places they had stayed, and the people in Briarton, the nearest town, never ventured this far into such a dark and forbidding wood. The seldom used trail around the lake, from where the soldier had fallen, was as close as any trail came to them. Jensen and her mother had gone into Briarton only once. It was unlikely that anyone even knew they were living out in the vast trackless mountains far from any farmland or city. Except for the chance encounter with Sebastian down closer to the lake, they'd never seen anyone near their place. This was the most secure spot she and her mother had ever had, and so Jensen had dared to begin to think of it as home. Since she was six, Jensen had been hunted. As careful as her mother always was, several times they had come frighteningly close to being snared. He was no ordinary man, the one who hunted her. He was not bound by ordinary means of searching. For all Jensen knew, the owl watching her from a high limb as she made her way up the rocky path could be his eyes watching her. Just as Jensen reached the house, she met her mother, throwing her cloak around her shoulders as she came out the door. She was the same height as Jensen, with the same thick hair to just past her shoulders, but more auburn than red. She was not yet 35, and the prettiest woman Jensen had ever seen, with a figure the creator himself would marvel at. In different circumstances, her mother's life would have been one of countless suitors, some no doubt willing to offer a king's ransom for her hand. Her mother's heart, though, was as loving and beautiful as her face, and she had given up everything to protect her daughter. When Jensen sometimes felt sorry for herself, for the normal things in life that she couldn't have, she would then think of her mother, who had willingly given up all those same things, and more, for the sake of her daughter. Her mother was as close as it came to a guardian spirit in the flesh. Jensen! 
Her mother rushed to her and seized her shoulders. Oh, Jen, I'm starting to worry, so where have you been? I was just coming to look for you. I thought you must have had some trouble, and I was... I did, mother, Jensen confided. Her mother paused only momentarily. Then, without further question, she embraced Jensen in protective arms. After such a frightening day, Jensen openly welcomed the bomb of her mother's hug. Finally, with a comforting arm encircling Jensen's shoulders, her mother urged her toward the door. Come inside and get yourself dry. I see you have quite the catch. We'll have a good dinner, and you can tell me... Jensen was dragging her feet. Mother, I have someone with me. Her mother halted, suddenly searching her daughter's face for any outward sign of the nature and depth of the trouble. What do you mean? Who would you have with you? Jensen flicked a hand back toward the path. He's waiting down there. I told him to wait. I told him I'd ask you if he could sleep in the cave with the animals. What? Stay here? Jen, what are you thinking? We can't... Mother, please, listen to me. Something terrible happened today. Sebastian. Sebastian! Jensen nodded. The man I brought with me. Sebastian helped me. I came across a soldier who fell from the path, the high trail around the lake. Her mother's face went ashen. She said nothing. Jensen took a calming breath and started again. I found a Daharan soldier dead in the gorge below the high trail. There were no other tracks. I looked. He was an extraordinarily big soldier, and he was heavily armed. Battle axe, sword at his hip, sword strapped over his shoulder. Her mother canted her head with an admonishing expression. What aren't you telling me, Jen? Jen wanted to hold it back until she explained Sebastian first, but her mother could read it in her eyes, hear it in her voice. The terrible threat of that piece of paper with the two words on it seemed almost to be screaming its presence from her pocket. Mother, please, let me tell it my way. Her mother cupped a hand at the side of Jensen's face. Tell me then, your way if you must. I was searching the soldier, looking for anything important, and I found something. But then, this man, a traveler, came upon me. I'm sorry, mother, I was frightened by the soldier being there, and by what I found, and I wasn't paying attention as I should have. I know I behaved foolishly. Her mother smiled. No, baby, we all have lapses. None of us can be perfect. We all sometimes make mistakes. That doesn't make you foolish. Don't say that about yourself. Well, I felt foolish when he said something and I turned around and there he was. I had my knife out, though. Her mother was nodding with a smile of approval. He saw then that the man had fallen to his death. He, Sebastian, that's his name, he said that if we just left him there, then more likely than not, other soldiers would find him and start questioning us all, and maybe blame us for their fellow soldier being dead. This man, Sebastian, sounds like he knows what he's talking about. I thought so, too. I had intended to cover the dead soldier to try to hide him, but he was big. I could never have dragged him over to a cranny by myself. Sebastian offered to help me bury the body. Together we were able to drag him over and roll him into a deep split in the rock. We covered him over good. Sebastian put some heavy rocks atop the gravel I scooped in. No one will find him. Her mother looked more relieved. That was wise. Before we buried him, Sebastian thought we should take anything valuable, rather than let it go to waste in the ground. One eyebrow arched. Did he now? Jensen nodded. She pulled the money from her pocket, the pocket that didn't have the piece of paper in it. She dumped all the money in her mother's hand. Sebastian insisted that I take it all. There's gold marks there. He didn't want any for himself. Her mother took in the fortune in her hand, then glanced briefly to the trail where Sebastian waited. She leaned closer. Jen, if he came with you, then perhaps he thinks he could have the money back at any time of his choosing. That would give him the opportunity to look generous and win your trust, and still be near enough to end up with the money when he chooses. I considered that too. Her mother's tone softened sympathetically. Jen, it's not your fault. I've kept you so sheltered. But you just don't know how men can be. Jensen let her gaze drop from her mother's knowing eyes. I suppose it could be true, but I don't think so. And why not? Jensen looked back up more intently this time. He has a fever, mother. He's not well. He was leaving without asking to come with me at all. He bid me a goodbye. As tired and feverish as he is, I feared he'd die out in the rain tonight. I stopped him, told him that if it was all right with you, he could sleep in the cave with the animals, where he could at least be dry and warm. After a moment of silence, Jensen added, he said that if you don't want a stranger near, he will understand and be on his way. Did he? Well, Jen, this man is either very honest or very clever. She fixed Jensen with an intent look. Which do you think it is, hmm? Jensen twined her fingers together. I don't know, mother. I honestly don't. I wondered the same things as you. I really did. She remembered then. He said that he wanted you to have this, so you wouldn't have to fear a stranger sleeping nearby. Jensen drew the knife in its sheath from behind her belt and held it out to her mother. The silver handle gleamed in the dim yellow light coming from the small window behind her mother. Staring in astonishment, her mother slowly lifted the weapon in both hands as she whispered, Dear spirits. I know, Jensen said. I nearly yelped in fright when I saw it. Sebastian said that this was a fine weapon, too fine to bury, and he wanted me to keep it. He kept the soldier's short sword and axe for himself. I told him I would give this to you. He said that he hoped it would help you feel safe. Her mother slowly shook her head. This does not make me feel safe at all, knowing that a man carrying this was near us. Jen, I don't like that one bit. Not one bit. Her mother's eyes showed that she was on to worries bigger than the man Jensen had brought home with her. Mother, Sebastian is sick. Can he stay in the cave? I led him to believe that he has more to fear from us than we from him. Her mother glanced up with a sly smile. Good girl. They both knew that in order to survive, they had to work as a team with well-practiced roles they fell into without the need for formal discussion. She let out a sigh, then, as if with the burden of knowing all the things her daughter was missing in life, she ran a hand tenderly down Benson's hair, letting it come to rest on her shoulder. All right, baby, she said at last. We'll let him stay the night. And feed him. I told him he would have a hot meal for helping me. Her mother's warm smile widened. And a meal, then. She drew the blade from its sheath, finally. She gave it a critical appraisal, turning it this way and that, inspecting its design. She tested the edge, and then the weight. She spun it between her slender fingers to get the feel of it, the balance. At last, she held it in her open palm, contemplating the ornate letter R. Jensen could not imagine what terrible thoughts and memories must be going through her mother's mind as she silently considered the emblem representing the house of Rawl. Dear spirits, her mother was pretty to Jensen didn't say anything. She entirely understood. It was an ugly, evil thing. Mother, Jensen whispered when her mother had looked at the for an eternity. It's almost dark. May I go get Sebastian and take him back to the cave? 
Her mother slid the blade home into the sheath, looking to put a panorama of painful memories away with it. Yes, I suppose you had better go get him. Take him to the cave. Make a fire for him. I'll cook some fish and bring some herbs along to help him sleep if he's feeling. Wait there with him until I come out. Keep your eye on him. We will eat with him out there. I don't want him in the house. Jensen nodded. She touched her mother's arm, halting her before she could go into the house. Jensen had one more thing to tell her mother. She dearly wished she didn't have to. She didn't want to bring her mother such a word, but she had to. Mother, she said, in a voice barely above a whisper. We are going to need to go from this place. Her mother looked startled. I found something on the Daharan soldier. Jensen pulled the piece of paper from her pocket, unfolded it, and held it out in her open palm. Her mother's gaze took in the two words on the paper. Dear spirits, was all she said, was all she was able to say. She turned and looked at the house, taking it all in, her eyes suddenly brimming with tears. Jensen knew that her mother had come to think of it at home, too. Dear spirits, her mother whispered to herself again, at a loss for anything more. Jensen thought the weight of it might overcome her, and her mother might break down in helpless tears. That was what Jensen wanted to do. Neither did she. Her mother wiped a finger under each eye as she looked back at Jensen. And then she did cry, one brief inhalation of a gasping sob of hopelessness. I'm so sorry, baby. It broke Jensen's heart to see her mother in such anguish. Everything that Jensen had missed in life, her mother had missed twice over, once for herself and once for her daughter. On top of it, her mother had to be strong. We'll leave at first light, her mother said in simple pronouncement. Traveling at night and in the rain will serve us ill. We'll have to find a new place to hide. He's getting too close to this one. Jensen's own eyes overflowed with tears and her voice came only with great difficulty. I'm so sorry, Mama, that I'm such trouble. Her tears flooded forth in a painful torrent. She crushed the piece of paper as her hands fisted. I'm so sorry, Mama. I wish you could be free of me. Her mother caught her up in her arms then, cradling Jensen's head to a shoulder as she wept. No, no, baby, don't ever say that. You're my light, my life. This trouble is caused by others. Don't you ever wear a cloak of guilt because they are evil. You're my wonderful life. I would give everything else up a thousand times over for you, and then once again, and be joyous to do so. Jensen was glad that she would never have any children, for she knew she didn't have her mother's strength. She held on for dear life to the only person in the world who was a comfort to her. But then she pushed away from her mother's embrace. Mama Sebastian is from far away, he told me. He said that he's from beyond Dahara. There are other places, other lands. He knows of them. Isn't that wonderful? There is a place that isn't Dahara. But those places are beyond barriers and boundaries that can't be crossed. Then how can he be here? It must be so. Otherwise, he could not have traveled here. And Sebastian is from one of these other lands? To the south, he said. The south? I don't see how it could be possible. Are you sure that's what he said? Yes. Jensen added a firm nod of confirmation. He said the south. He only mentioned it casually. I'm not sure how it's possible, but what if it is? Mother, maybe he could guide us there. Maybe if we asked, he would guide us out of this nightmare land. As level-headed as her mother was, Jensen could see that she was considering this wild idea. It wasn't crazy. Her mother was thinking it over, so it couldn't be crazy. Jensen was suddenly filled with a sense of hope that maybe she had come up with something that would save them. Why would he do this for us? I don't know. I don't even know if he would consider it, or what he would want in return. I didn't ask him. I didn't dare even to mention it until I talked to you first. That's part of why I wanted him to stay here, so you could question him. I feared to lose this chance to discover if it really is possible. Her mother looked around again at the house. It was tiny, only one room, and it was nothing fancy, built from logs and wood they had shaped themselves, but it was warm and snug and dry. It was frightening to contemplate striking out in the dead of winter. The alternative of being caught, though, was far worse. Jensen knew what would happen if they were caught. Death would not come swiftly. If they were caught, death would come only after endless torture. At last, her mother gathered herself and spoke. That's good thinking, Jen. I don't know if anything can come of such an idea, but we'll talk to Sebastian and see. One thing is for sure, we have to leave. We dare not delay until spring, not if they're this close. We'll leave at dawn. Mother, where will we go? This time, if Sebastian won't lead us away from Dahara. Her mother smiled. Baby, the world is a big place. We are only two small people. We will simply vanish again. I know it's hard, but we're together. It will be fine. We'll see some new sights now, won't we? Some more of the world. Now go get Sebastian and take him to the cave. I'll get started on dinner. We'll all need to have a good meal. Jensen quickly kissed her mother's cheek before racing down the trail. The rain was starting, and it was so gloomy among the trees that she could hardly see. The trees were all huge Daharan soldiers to her, broad, powerful, grim. She knew she would have nightmares after seeing a real Daharan soldier up close. Sebastian was still sitting on the rock waiting. He stood as she rushed up to him. My mother said it was all right for you to sleep in the cave with the animals. She started on cooking up the fish for us. She wants to meet you. He looked too tired to be happy, but he managed to show her a small smile. Jensen seized his wrist and urged him to follow her. He was already shivering with the wet. His arm was warm, though. Fever was like that, she knew. You shivered even though you were burning up. But with some food and herbs and a good night's rest, she was sure he would soon be well. What she wasn't sure of was if he would help them. Chapter 5 Betty, their brown goat, watched attentively from her hand, occasionally voicing her displeasure at sharing her home, as Jensen quickly collected straw to the side for the stranger in Betty's sanctuary. Bleeding her distress, Betty finally quieted when Jensen affectionately scratched the nervous goat's ears, patted the wiry hair covering her round middle, and then gave her half a carrot from the stash up on a high ledge. Betty's short upright tail wagged furiously. Sebastian shed his cloak and pack, but kept on the belt with his new weapons. He unstrapped his bedroll from under his pack and spread it out over the mat of straw. 
Despite Jensen's urging, he wouldn't lie down and rest while she knelt near the cave's entrance and prepared the fire pit. As he helped her stack dry kindling, she could see by the dim light coming from the window of the house on the other side of the clearing that sweat beaded his face. He repeatedly scraped his knife down the length of a branch, swiftly building a clump of fluffy fibers. He struck a steel to flint several times, sending sparks through the darkness into the tinder he'd made. He cupped the fluff in his hands, and with gentle puffs of breath nursed the slow flames until they strengthened, then placed the burning tinder beneath the kindling, where the flames quickly grew and popped to life among the dry twigs. The branches released a pleasing fragrance of balsam as they caught flame. Jensen had been planning on running to the house not far off to get some hot coals to start the fire, but he had it going before she could even suggest it. By the way he trembled, she imagined he was impatient for heat, even though he was burning with fever. She could smell the aroma of the frying fish coming from the house, and when the wind among the pine boughs died from time to time, she could hear the sizzle. The chickens retreated from the growing light into the deep shadows at the back of the cave. Betty's ears stood at attention as she watched Jensen for any signs that another carrot might be forthcoming. Her tail wagged in hopeful fits. The opening in the mountain was simply a place where, in some distant age past, a slab of rock had tumbled out, like some giant granite tooth come loose, to plunge down the slope and leave a dry socket behind. Now trees below grew among a collection of such fallen boulders. The cave only ran back about 20 feet, but the overhang of rock at the entrance further sheltered it and helped keep it dry. Jensen was tall, but the ceiling of the cave was high enough that she could stand in most of it, and since Sebastian was only a little taller than she, his spikes of snow-white hair, now a mellow orange in the firelight, didn't brush the top as he went to the back to collect some of the dry wood stacked there. The chickens squawked at being bothered, but then quickly settled back down. Jensen squatted on the opposite side of the fire from Sebastian with her back to the rain that had started so she could see his face in the firelight as they both warmed their hands in the heat of the crackling flames. After a day in the frigid, damp weather, the fire's warmth felt luxurious. She knew that sooner or later, winter would return with a vengeance. As cold and uncomfortable as it was now, it would get worse. She tried not to think about having to leave their snug home, especially at this time of year. She had known from the first instant she saw the piece of paper, though, that they might. Are you hungry? She asked. Starving, he said, looking as eager for the fish as Betty was for a carrot. The wonderful smells were making her stomach rumble, too. That's good. My mother always says that if you're ill and you have an appetite, then it can't be too serious. I'll be fine in a day or two. A rest will do you good. Jensen drew her knife from its sheath at her belt. We've never allowed anyone to stay here before. You will understand that we will be taking precautions. She could see in his eyes that he didn't know what she was talking about, but he shrugged his understanding of her prudence. Jensen's knife wasn't anything like the fine weapon the soldier had been carrying. They could afford nothing like that knife. Hers had a simple handle made of antler, and the blade wasn't thick, but she kept its edge razor sharp. Jensen used the blade to slice a shallow cut across the inside of her forearm. With a frown, Sebastian started to rise, the voice of protest. Her challenging glare stopped him cold before he was halfway up. He sank back down and watched with growing concern as she wiped the sides of the blade through the crimson beads of blood welling up from the cut. She very deliberately looked him in the eye again before turning her back on him and moving out closer to the edge of the cave where the rain dampened the ground. With the knife wetted in blood, Jensen first drew a large circle. Feeling Sebastian's eyes on her, she next pulled the tip of the bloody blade through the damp earth in straight lines to make a square, its corners just touching the inside of the circle. With hardly a pause, she drew a smaller circle that touched the insides of the square. As she worked, she murmured prayers under her breath, asking the good spirits to guide her hand. It seemed the right thing to do. She knew that Sebastian could hear her soft sing-song, but not make out the words. It occurred unexpectedly to her that it must be something like the voices she heard in her own head. Sometimes when she drew the outer circle, she heard the whisper of that dead voice call her name. Opening her eyes from the prayer, she drew an eight-pointed star, its rays piercing all the way through the inner circle, the square, and then the outer circle. Every other ray bisected a corner of the square. The rays were said to represent the gift of the Creator. So, as she drew the eight-pointed star, Jensen always whispered a prayer of thanks for the gift of her mother. When she finished and looked up, her mother was standing before her, as if she had risen from the shadows or materialized from the edge of the drawing itself to be lit by the leaping flames of the fire behind Jensen. In the light of those flames, her mother was like a vision of some impossibly beautiful spirit. Do you know what this drawing represents, young man? Jensen's mother asked, in a voice hardly more than a whisper. Jensen stared up at her, the way people often stared when they first saw her, and shook his head. It's called a grace. They have been drawn by those with the gift of magic for thousands of years. Some say since the dawn of creation itself. The outer circle represents the beginning of the eternity of the underworld, the keeper's world of the dead. The inner circle is the extent of the world of life. The square represents the veil that separates both worlds, life from death. It touches both at times. The star is the light of the gift from the creator himself. Magic, extending through life and crossing over into the world of the dead. The fire crackled and hissed as Jensen's mother, like some spectral figure, towered over the two of them. Sebastian said nothing. Her mother had spoken the truth, but it was truth used to convey a specific impression that was not true. My daughter has drawn this grace as protection for you as you rest this night, and as protection for us. There is another before the door to the house. She let the silence drag before adding, It would be unwise to cross either without our consent. I understand, Mrs. Saget. In the firelight, his face showed no emotion. His blue eyes turned to Jensen. A hint of a smile came to his lips, even though his expression remained serious. You are a surprising woman, Jensen Dagger, a woman of many mysteries. I will sleep safely tonight. And well, Jensen's mother said, besides the dinner, I brought some herbs to help you sleep. Her mother, holding the bowl full of fried fish in one hand, collected Jensen with a hand on her shoulder and guided her around to the back of the fire to sit beside her, on the opposite side of her from Sebastian. By the sober look on his face, their demonstration had had the desired effect. Her mother glanced at Jensen and gave her a smile Sebastian couldn't see. Jensen had done well. Holding the bowl out, her mother offered Sebastian some fish, saying, I would like to thank you, young man, for the help you gave Jensen today. 
Sebastian, please. So Jensen has told me. I was glad to help. It was helping myself too, really. I'd not like to have Daharan soldiers chasing me. She pointed. If you would accept it, this one on top is coated with the herbs that will help you sleep. He used his knife to stab the darker piece of fish coated in the herbs. Jensen took another on her own knife after first wiping the blade clean on her skirts. Jensen tells me that you are from outside Dahara. He glanced up as he chewed. That's right. I find that hard to believe. Dahara is bordered by impassable boundaries. In my lifetime, no one has been able to come into or leave Dahara. How is it possible then that you have? With his teeth, Sebastian pulled the chunk of herb-coated fish off his knife. He inhaled between his teeth to cool the bite. He gestured around with the blade as he chewed. How long have you been out here alone in this great wood, without seeing people, without news? Several years. Oh, well then, I guess it makes sense that you wouldn't know. But since you've been out here, the barriers have come down. Jensen and her mother both took in this staggering, nearly incomprehensible news in silence. In that silence, they both dared to begin to imagine the heady possibilities. For the first time in Jensen's life, escape seemed conceivable. The impossible dream of a life of their own suddenly seemed only a journey away. They had been traveling and hiding their whole life. Now it seemed the journey might at last be near the end. Sebastian, Jensen's mother said, why did you help Jensen today? I like to help people. She needed help. I could tell how much that man scared her even though he was dead. He smiled at Jensen. She looked nice. I wanted to help her. Besides, he finally admitted. I don't much care for Daharan soldiers. When she gestured by lifting the bowl toward him, he stabbed another piece of fish. Mrs. Daggett, I'm liable to fall asleep before long. Why don't you just tell me what's on your mind? We are hunted by Daharan soldiers. Why? That's a story for another night. Depending on the outcome of this night, you may yet learn it. But for now, all that really matters is that we are hunted, Jensen more so than me. If the Daharan soldiers catch us, she will be murdered. Her mother made it sound simple. He would not let it be so simple. It would be much more grisly than any mere murder. Death would be a reward gained only after inconceivable agony and endless begging. Sebastian glanced over at Jensen. I'd not like that. Then we three are of a single mind, her mother murmured. That's why the two of you are good friends with those knives you keep at hand, he said. That's why, her mother confirmed. So, Sebastian said, you fear the Daharan soldiers finding you. Daharan soldiers aren't exactly a rarity. The one today gave you both a scare. What makes you both fear this one today so much? Jensen added a stout stick to the fire, glad to have her mother to do the talking. Betty bleated for a carrot for at least attention. The chickens rumbled about the noise and light. Jensen, her mother said, show Sebastian the piece of paper you found on the Daharan soldier. Taken aback, Jensen waited until her mother's eyes turned her way. They shared a look that told Jensen her mother was determined to take this chance, and if she was to try, then they had to at least tell him some of it. Jensen drew the crumpled piece of paper from her pocket and handed it past her mother to Sebastian. I found this in that Taharan soldier's pocket. She swallowed at the ghastly memory of seeing a dead person, just before you showed up. Sebastian pulled the crumpled paper open, smoothing it between a thumb and finger as he cast them both a suspicious look. He turned the paper toward the firelight, so he could see the two words. Jensen Lindy, he said, reading it from the piece of paper. I don't get it, who's Jensen Lindy? Me, Jensen said. At least it was for a while. For a while? I don't understand. That was my name, Jensen said, the name I used anyway a few years back when we lived far to the north. We move around often, to keep from being caught. We change our name each time so it will be harder to track us. Then Daggett is not a real name either? No. Well, what is your real name then? That too is part of the story for another night. Her mother's tone said that she didn't mean to discuss it. What matters is that the soldier today had that name. That can only mean the worst. But you said it's a name you no longer use. You use a different name here, Daggett. No one here knows you by that name, Lindy. Her mother leaned toward Sebastian. Jensen knew her mother was giving him a look that he would find uncomfortable. Her mother had a way of making people nervous when she fixed them with that intent, penetrating gaze of hers. It may no longer be our name, a name we use only far to the north, but he had that name written down, and he was here, mere miles from where we are now. That means he has somehow connected that name with us, with two women somewhere up in this remote place. Somehow he connected it, or more precisely, the man who hunts us connected it and sent him after us. Now they search for us. Sebastian broke her gaze and took a thoughtful breath. I see what you mean. He went back to eating the piece of fish, skewered on the point of his knife. That dead soldier would have others with him, her mother said. By burying him, you bought us time. They won't know what happened to him. We have that much luck. We are still a few steps ahead of them. We must use our advantage to get away before they tighten the noose. We will have to leave in the morning. Are you sure? He gestured around with his knife. You have a life here. Your lives are remote, hidden. I would never have found you had I not seen Jensen with that dead soldier. How could they find you? You have a house, a good place. Life is the word that matters in all that you said. I know the man who hunts us. He has thousands of years of bloody heritage as guidance in hunting us. He will not rest. If we stay, sooner or later he will find us. We must escape while we can. She pulled from her belt the exquisite knife Jensen had brought her from the dead to soldiers. soldier. Still in its sheath, she spun it in her fingers, presenting a tilt first to Sebastian. This letter R on the hilt stands for the house of Rawl, our hunter. He would only have presented a weapon this fine to a very special soldier. I don't want a weapon that has been presented by that evil man. Sebastian glanced down at the knife tendered, but didn't take it. He gave them both a look that unexpectedly chilled Jensen to the bone. It was a look that burned with ruthless determination. Where I come from, we believe in using what is closest to an enemy, or what comes from him, as a weapon against him. Jensen had never heard such a sentiment. Her mother didn't move. The knife still lay in her hand. I don't. Do you choose to use what he has inadvertently given you and turn it against him? Or do you choose instead to be a victim? What do you mean? Why don't you kill him? Jensen's jaw dropped. Her mother seemed less astonished. We can't, she insisted. He's a powerful man. 
he is protected by countless people, from simple soldiers to soldiers of great skill at killing, like the one you buried today, to people with the gift who can call upon magic. We are but two simple women. Sebastian was not moved by her plea. He won't stop until he kills you. He lifted a piece of paper, watching her eyes take it in. This proves it. He will never stop. Why don't you kill him before he kills you, kills your daughter? Or will you choose to be corpses he has yet to collect? Her mother's voice heated. And how do you propose we kill the Lord Rahl? Sebastian stabbed another piece of fish. For starters, you should keep the knife. It's a weapon superior to the one you carry. Use what is his to fight him. Your sentimental objection to taking it only serves him, not you or Jensen. Her mother sat still as stone. Jensen had never heard anyone talk to her. His words had a way of making her see things differently than she ever had before. I must admit that what you say makes sense, her mother said. Her voice came softly and laced with pain or perhaps regret. You have opened my eyes, a little anyway. I don't agree with you that we should try to kill him, for I know him all too well. Such an attempt would be simple suicide at best, or accomplish his goal at worst. But I will keep the knife, and use it to defend myself and my daughter. Thank you, Sebastian, for speaking sense when I didn't want to hear it. I'm glad you're keeping the knife at least. Sebastian pulled the bite of fish off his own knife. I hope it can help you. With the back of his hand, he wiped the sweat from his brow. If you don't want to try to kill him in order to save yourself, then what do you propose to do? Keep running? You say the barriers are down. I propose to leave Dahara. We will try to make it to another land where Dark and Rawl cannot hunt us. Sebastian looked up as he stabbed another piece of fish. Dark and Rawl. Dark and Rawl is dead. Jensen, having run from the man since she was little. Having awakened countless times from nightmares of his blue eyes watching her from every shadow, or of him leaping out to snatch her when her feet wouldn't move fast enough. Having lived every day wondering if this was the day he would finally catch her. Having imagined a thousand times, and then another thousand, what terrible, brutal, torturous things he would do to her. Having prayed to the good spirits every day for deliverance from her merciless hunter, and his implacable minions was thunderstruck. He realized only then that she had always thought of the man as next to immortal, as immortal as evil itself. Dark and Rawl, dead? It can't be. Jensen said as tears of deliverance welled up and ran down her cheeks. She was filled with a wild, heart-pounding sense of expectant hope, and at the same time, an inexplicable shadow of dark dread. Sebastian nodded. It's true. About two years ago, from what I heard, Jensen gave voice to the hope. Then he is no longer the threat we thought, she paused. But if Dark and Rawl is dead... Dark and Rawl's son is Lord Rawl now, Sebastian said. His son? Jensen felt her hope being eclipsed by that dark dread. The Lord Rahl hunts us, her mother said, her voice calm and enduring, betraying no evidence of even a moment of exalted hope. The Lord Rahl is the Lord Rahl. It is now as it has always been, as it will always be, as immortal as evil itself. Richard Rahl, Sebastian put in. He's the Lord Rahl now. Richard Rahl. So now Jensen knew her hunter's new name. A terrifying thought washed over her. She had never before heard the voice say anything more than surrender and her name, and occasionally those strange foreign words she didn't understand. Now it demanded she surrender her flesh, her very will. If it was the voice of the one who hunted her, as her mother said, then this new Lord Rahl must be even more terrifyingly powerful than his wicked father. Fleeting salvation had left behind grim despair. This man, Richard Rahl, her mother said, searching for understanding amid all the startling news. He ascended to rule as the Lord Rahl of Dahara when his father died then? Sebastian leaned forward, a cloaked rage unexpectedly surfacing in his blue eyes. Richard Rahl became the Lord Rahl of Dahara when he murdered his father and seized rule. And if you are next going to suggest that perhaps the son is less of a threat than his father, then let me set you straight. Richard Rahl is the one who brought down the barriers. At that, Jensen threw up her hands in confusion. But that would only give those who wish to be free their opening to escape Dahara, to escape him. No, he brought those ancient protective barriers down so he could extend his tyrannical rule to the lands that were beyond the reach of even his father. Sebastian thumped his chest once with a tight fist. My land he wants. Lord Rahl is a madman. Dahara is not enough for him to rule. He lusts to dominate the entire world. Jensen's mother stared off into the flames, looking dispirited. I always thought, hoped, I guess, that if Dark and Rahl were dead, then maybe we might have a chance. The piece of paper Jensen found today with her name on it now tells me that the son is even more dangerous than his father, and that I was only deluding myself. Even Dark and Rahl never got this close to us. Jensen felt numb after having been rocked by a turbulent swing of emotions, only to be left more terrified and hopeless than before. But seeing such despair on her mother's face wounded her heart. I will keep the knife. Her mother's decision said how much she feared the new Lord Rahl, and how frightful was their plight. Good. Dim light coming from the house reflected off the swollen pools of water standing beyond the cave entrance, but the droning rain churned the light into thousands of sparkles, like the tears of the good spirits themselves. In a day or two, the collection of ponds would be ice. Traveling would be easier in that cold than in cold rain. Sebastian, Jensen asked, do you think, well, do you think we could escape Dahara? Maybe go to your homeland, escape the reach of this monster? Sebastian shrugged. Maybe. But until this madman is killed, will there be anywhere beyond his ravenous reach? Her mother tucked the exquisite knife behind her belt and then folded her fingers together around one bent knee. Thank you, Sebastian. You've helped us. Being in hiding has regrettably kept us in the dark. You've at least brought us a bit of light. Sorry it wasn't better news. The truth is the truth. It helps us know what to do. Her mother smiled at her. Jensen always was one who sought to know the truth of things. I've never kept it from her. Truth is the only means of survival. It's as simple as that. If you don't want to try to kill him in order to eliminate the threat, maybe you can think of some way to make the new Lord Rahl lose interest in you, in Jensen. Jensen's mother shook her head. There are more things involved than we can tell you tonight. Things you are in the dark about. Because of them, he will never rest, never stop. You don't understand the lengths to which the Lord Rahl, any Lord Rahl, will go in order to kill Jensen. If that's so, then perhaps you're right. Maybe the two of you should run. And would you help us? Help her? To get away from Dahara? He looked from one of them to the other. 
If I can, I guess I'll try. But I'm telling you, there is no place to hide. If you ever want to be free, you'll have to kill him. I'm no assassin, Jensen said. Not so much out of protest as out of acceptance of her own frailty in the face of such brutal strength. I want to live, but I just don't have the nature to be an assassin. I will defend myself, but I don't think I could effectively set out to kill someone. The sad fact is, I just wouldn't be any good at it. He's a killer by birth, I'm not. Sebastian met her gaze with an icy look. His white hair cast red by the firelight framed cold blue eyes. You'd be surprised what a person can do if they have the proper motivation. Her mother lifted a hand to halt such talk. She was a practical woman, not given to wasting valuable time on wild schemes. Right now the important thing is for us to get away. Lord Raw's minions are too close, that's the simple truth of it. From the description and this knife, the dead man you found today was probably part of a quad. Sebastian looked up with a frown. A what? A team of four assassins. On occasion, several quads will work together if the target has proven particularly elusive or is of inestimable worth. Jensen is both. Sebastian rested an arm over his knee. For someone on the run and in hiding all these years, you seem to know a lot about these quads. Are you sure you're right? Firelight danced in her mother's eyes. Her voice turned more distant. When I was young, I used to live in people's palace. I used to see those men, the quads. Dark and Rawl used them to hunt people. They are ruthless beyond anything you can imagine. Sebastian looked uneasy. Well, I guess you would know better than I. In the morning then, we leave. He yawned as he stretched. Your herbs are already working and this fever has exhausted me. After a good night's sleep, I'll help you both get away from here, away from Dahar, and on your way to the old world, if that's your wish. It is, her mother stood. You two eat the rest of the fish. As she moved past, her loving fingers trailed along the back of Jensen's head. I'm going to go collect some of our things, get together what we can carry. I'll be right in, Jensen said, as soon as I back the fire. Chapter 6 The rain was getting worse. Runoff ran in a rippled sheet over the ledge at the brow of the cave. Jensen scratched Betty behind her ears to try to stop her bleating. The always nervous goat was suddenly inconsolable. Perhaps she sensed that they were going to be leaving. Maybe she was just unhappy that Jensen's mother had gone into the house. Betty loved that woman, and would often follow her around the yard like a puppy. Betty would be only too happy to sleep in the house with them both if they would let her. Sebastian, having had his fill of fish, rolled himself in his cloak. His eyelids drooped as he tried to watch her bank the fire. He lifted his head and frowned over at the pacing goat. Betty will settle down when I go in the house, Jensen told him. Sebastian, already half asleep, mumbled something about Betty that Jensen couldn't even begin to hear over the noise of the rain. She knew it wasn't important enough to ask him to repeat it. He needed sleep. She yawned. Despite her anxiety over everything that had happened that day, and her worry about what the next would bring, the din of the downpour was making her sleepy too. As much as she ached to ask him about what was beyond Dahara, she bid him a good night's sleep, even though she doubted that he heard her over the rain. She would have time enough to ask him all her questions. Her mother would be waiting for help with selecting what to take and packing it. They didn't have much, but they would have to leave some of what they had. At least the clumsy dead Daharan soldier had provided them with money just when they would need it most. It was enough money to buy horses and supplies that would help them get out of Dahara. The new Lord Ra, the bastard son of a bastard son in an unbroken long line of bastard sons, had inadvertently provided them with the means to escape his grasp. Life was so precious, she just wanted her and her mother to be able to live their own lives. Somewhere over the distant dark horizon lay their new life. Jensen threw her cloak around her shoulders. She pulled the hood up to protect herself from the rain, but as hard as it was coming down, she expected she was likely to get wet on the run to the house. She hoped the morning had gone clear for the first day of travel, so they could put distance between them and their pursuers. She was pleased to see that Sebastian looked dead to the world. He needed a good sleep. She was thankful that amid all the torment and injustice, at least he had come into their lives. Jensen picked up the bowl with a few remaining pieces of fish, tucked it under her cloak, held her breath, and, lowering her head against the onslaught, dove into the roaring rain. The cold shock of the downpour made her gasp as she splashed through the dark puddles on her dash to the house. She made the house, her wet lashes turning the dim light of the oil lamps and firelight coming through the window to a blinking blur. Without looking up, she threw the door open as she ran in. It's cold as the keeper's heart, she called out to her mother as she raced in. Jensen's breath left her lungs in a grunt as she crashed into a solid wall that had never been there before. Rebounding from the collision, she looked up to see a broad back turning, to see a huge hand snatching for her. The hand caught only her cloak. The heavy wool cloak stripped away from her as she fell back. The bowl thudded to the floor, spinning like a crazy top. The door bounced back from hitting the wall, banging closed behind her, trapping her just before her back slammed into it. Gasping, Jensen reacted. With a wild instinct, not the thought. Jensen. Terror, not technique. Surrender. Desperation, not design. The man's blocky face was clearly lit by the fire from the heart. He plunged toward her, a monster with stringy wet hair. Straining sinew and muscle twisted in rage. The knife in her fist whipped around, powered by stark terror. Her cry was a growl of panicked effort. Her knife slammed into the side of his head. The blade snapped at mid-length as it hit his cheekbone. His head twisted from the impact. Blood splashed across his face. Swinging madly, his meaty hand walloped her face. Her shoulder hit the wall. A shock of pain lanced her arm. She stumbled on something. Thrown off balance, she tumbled past her footing. Her face smacked the floor beside another of the huge men. He was like the dead soldier she had buried. Her mind grasped at snatches of what she was seeing, trying to make sense of it. Where did they come from? How were they in her house? Her leg was draped over the man's still legs. She pushed herself up. He was slumped against the wall. His dead eyes stared at her. The handle with the ornate R sideways below his ear reflected sparkles of firelight. The point of the knife jutted from the other side of his bull neck. He wore a wet red shirt. Surrender. With cold fright, she saw a man coming for her. Ripping her broken knife, she scrambled to her feet, turning toward the threat. She saw her mother on the floor. A man held her by the hair. There was blood everywhere. Nothing seemed real. In a nightmare vision, Jensen saw her mother's severed arm on the floor, fingers slack and open, red stab wounds. Jensen. 
Panic ruled her mind. She heard her own short, choppy screams. Wet blood splashed across the floor, glistened in the firelight. Whirling movement. A man slammed into her, driving her to the wall. She lost her breath. Pain crushed her chest. Surrender. No! Her own voice seemed unreal. She slashed with her broken knife, ripping the man's arm. He bellowed a vile oath. The man holding Jensen's mother dropped her and made for Jensen. She stabbed wildly, frantically at the men around her. Reaching hands shot toward her from all around. A huge hand clamped her thrashing knife arm. Surrender. Jensen gasped a cry. She struggled savagely. She kicked. She bit. Men cursed. The second man seized her throat in iron fingers. No breath. No breath. She tried. Couldn't breathe. Tried desperately, but couldn't draw a breath. He sneered as he squeezed her throat. Pain shot up through her temples. His cheek, slashed by her knife, laid open from ear to mouth, ran with gouts of blood. She could see glistening red blood through the gaping wound. Jensen struggled but couldn't pull a breath. A fist slammed her stomach. She kicked him. He seized her ankle before she could kick him again. One was dead. Two had her. Her mother down. Her vision was narrowing to a black tunnel. Her chest burned. It hurt so much. So much. Sound was muffled. She heard a bone jarring. Thunk. The man in front of her, squeezing her throat, staggered once as his head jerked. It made no sense to her. His grip went slack. She gasped an urgent breath. His head tipped forward. A crescent-bladed axe was embedded in the back of the man's neck, severing his spine. The axe handle swung in an arc as he dropped his bastard. Measured fury with white hair stood behind him. The last man had pulled her arm. His other fist brought up a blood slick sword. Sebastian was quicker than the man. Jensen was quicker even than Sebastian. Surrender. She cried out an animal sound, savage, unbridled terror and fury. Her broken blade slashed across the side of the man's neck. Her half blade ripped bone deep, cut the artery, severed muscles. He cried out. Blood seemed to float, suspended in midair as the man pitched against the far wall on his way down. She'd swung so hard she fell sprawling with it. Sebastian's short sword struck like lightning, slamming through the great barrel chest with bone cracking power. Jensen scrambled over the bodies, slipping on blood. She saw only her mother on the floor, half sitting, leaning against the far wall. Her mother watched her come. Jensen couldn't stop screaming, couldn't breathe through her hysterical cries. Her mother, covered in blood, eyelids half closed, looked as if she were falling asleep. But she had that spark of joy at seeing Jensen. Always that spark in her eyes. Her face had bloody streaks from big fingers down the side. She smiled her beautiful smile at seeing Jensen. She whispered. Jensen couldn't make herself stop screaming, shaking. She didn't look down at the awful red wounds. She saw only her mother's face. Mama, mama, mama! One arm embraced her. Her other was gone. Her knife arm, gone. The one around Jensen was love and comfort and shelter. Her mother smiled a weary smile. Listen to me. Sebastian was there, working frantically to tie something around with his left and the mother's right arm, trying to stem the tide of blood. Her mother would be so Jensen. I'm here, Mama. Everything will be fine. I'm here. Mama, don't die. Don't die. Hold on, Mama. Hold on. Listen. Her voice was hardly more than a breath. I'm listening, Mama. Jensen cried. I'm listening. I'm gone. I'm crossing to be with the good spirits now. No, Mama. No, please, no. Can't help it, baby. It's all right. The good spirits will take good care of me. Jensen held her mother's face in both hands, trying to see it through the helpless flood of tears. Jensen gasped with frantic sobs. Mama, don't leave me alone. Don't leave me. Please, oh, please don't. Oh, Mama, I love you. Love you, baby, more than anything. I've taught you all I can. Listen now. Jensen nodded, fearing to miss a single precious word. The good spirits are taking me. You must understand that. When I go, this body won't be me any longer. Understand? I don't need it anymore. It doesn't hurt at all. Not at all. Isn't that a wonder? I'm with the good spirits. You must be strong now and leave what is no longer me. Mama! Jensen could only sob in agony as she held the face she loved more than life itself. He's coming for you, Jen. Run. Don't stay with this body to visit me after I'm with the good spirits. Understand? No, Mama, I can't leave you. I can't. You must. Don't foolishly risk your life just to bury this useless body. It isn't me. I'm in your heart and with the good spirits. This body isn't me. Understand, baby? Yes, Mama, not you. You'll be with the good spirits, not here. Her mother nodded in Jensen's hands. Good girl. Take the knife. I took one out with it. It's a worthy weapon. Mama, I love you. Jensen wished for better words, but there were none. I love you. I love you. That's why you must run, baby. I don't want you to throw your life away over what is no longer me. Your life is too precious. Leave this empty vessel. Run, Jen, or he'll get you. Run. Her eyes turned towards Sebastian. Help her. Sebastian, right there, nodded. I swear I will. She looked back at Jensen and smiled her sweet love. I'll always be in your heart, baby. Always. Love you, always. Oh, Mama, you know I love you. Always. Her mother smiled as she watched her daughter. Jensen's fingers caressed her mother's beautiful face. For a fleeting eternity, her mother watched her. Until Jensen realized that her mother was no longer seeing anything in this world. Jensen fell against her mother, dissolving in tears and terror, choking in sobs. Everything had ended. The crazy, senseless world had ended. Her arms stretched out toward her mother as she was pulled away. Jensen, his mouth was close to her ear. We have to do what she wanted. No, please, oh, please, no, she wailed. He gently pulled. Jensen, do as she asked. We must. Jensen pounded her fists against the blood slick floor. No. The world had ended. Please, no, no, it can't be. Jen, we have to go. You go, she sobbed. I don't care. I give up. No, Jen, you don't. You can't. His arm around her middle lifted her, set her on her wobbly legs. Numb, Jensen couldn't move. Nothing was real. Everything was a dream. The world was crumbling to ash. Holding her by her upper arms, he shook her. Jensen, we have to get out of here. She turned her head and looked at her mother on the floor. We have to do something, please. We have to do something. Yes, we do. We have to leave before more men show up. His face was dripping. She wondered if it was rain. As if she were watching herself from some great disconnected distance, her own thoughts seemed crazy to her. Jensen, listen to me. 
Her mother had said that. It was important. Listen to me. We have to get out of here. Your mother was right. We have to go. He turned to the pack beside the lamp on the table at the side of the room. Jensen slumped to the floor. Her knees hit with a thump. She was empty of everything but the hot coals of agony from which she could not pull away. Why did everything have to be so wrong? Jensen crawled toward her sleeping mother. She couldn't. No, she couldn't. Jensen loved her too much for her to die. Jensen, grieve later. We have to get out of here. Out the open door, the rain poured down. I won't leave her. Your mother made a sacrifice for you, so you would have a life. Don't throw away her final act of courage. He was stuffing whatever he could find in a pack. You have to do as she said. She loves you and wants you to live. She told you to run. I swore I'd help you. We have to leave before they catch us here. She stared at the door. It had been closed. She remembered crashing into it. Now it stood open. Maybe the latch broke. A huge shadow materialized out of the rain, melting through the doorway into the house. The brawny man's eyes fixed on her. Feral fright surged through her. He moved toward her, faster and faster. Jensen saw the knife with the ornate R sticking from the side of a dead man's neck. The knife her mother told her to take. It wasn't far. Her mother had lost her arm, her life, to kill him. The man, seemingly oblivious of Sebastian, dove for Jensen. She dove for the knife. Her fingers, greasy with blood, seized the handle. The worked metal gave good grip. Art with purpose, deadly art. With teeth ritted, she yanked the blade free and rolled. Before the man reached her, Sebastian growled with the effort what? of burying his axe in the back of the man's head. The soldier crashed to the floor beside her, his meaty arm falling across her middle. Jensen, crying out, wriggled out from under the arm as blood grew in a dark pool beneath his head. Sebastian pulled her up. Get whatever you want to take, he ordered. She moved through the room, walking in a dream. The world had gone mad. Perhaps it was she who had finally gone mad. The voice in her head whispered to her in its strange language. She found herself listening, almost comforted by it. Tu vas misht, tu vas misht, grushtiva du kalt misht. We have to go, Sebastian said. Get what you want to take. She couldn't think. She didn't know what to do. She blocked the voice and told herself to do as her mother said to do. She went to the cupboard and rapidly began picking things out that they always took when they traveled. Things always at the ready. Traveling clothes were kept in her pack, ready to leave at a moment's notice. She threw herbs, spices, and dried food in on top of them. She pulled other clothes, a brush, a small mirror, from a simple chest of woven branches. Her hand paused when she started grabbing her mother's clothes for her. She stopped, fingers trembling, focusing on her mother's orders. She couldn't think, so she moved like a trained animal, doing as she had been taught. They'd had to run before. She scanned the room. Four dead Daharans. One that morning. That made five. A quad plus one. Where were the other three? In the dark outside the door, in the trees, in the dark woods, waiting, waiting to take her to Lord Rawl to be tortured to death. With both hands, Sebastian seized her wrist. Jensen, what are you doing? She realized she was stabbing at the empty air. She watched as he pried the knife from her fist and returned it to its sheath. He tucked it behind her belt. He scooped up her cloak, which the huge Daharan soldier had ripped off her as she had first fallen into the nightmare. Hurry up, Jensen. Grab anything else you want. Sebastian rifled through the dead men's pockets, pulling out money he found, cramming it in his own pockets. He unstrapped all four knives, none as good as the one he'd tucked behind her belt, the one with the ornate letter R on the handle, the one from the fallen dead man, the one her mother had used. Sebastian slipped the four knives down the side of the pack as he yelled at her again to hurry. While he took the best sword from one of the men, Jensen went to the table. She scooped up candles and stuffed them in the pack. Sebastian attached the scabbard of the sword to his weapons belt. Jensen collected small implements, cooking utensils, pots, pushing them in her pack. She wasn't really aware of what she was taking, she was just picking up whatever she saw and putting it in. Sebastian lifted her pack, took one of her wrists, and stuffed it through the strap, as if he were handling a rag doll. He put her other arm through the other strap he held out for her, then threw her cloak around her shoulders. After he pulled the hood up over her head, he stuffed her red hair in the pack. He held her mother's pack in one hand. He tugged twice and freed his axe from the soldier's skull. Blood ran down the handle as he hooked the axe on his weapon's belt. With the heel of his sword hand against the small of her back, he urged her onward. Anything else? he asked as they moved toward the door. Jensen, do you want anything else from your house before we go? Jensen looked over her shoulder at her mother on the floor. She's gone, Jensen. The good spirits are taking care of her now. She's smiling down on you now. Jensen looked up at him. Really? You think so? Yes, she's in a better world now. She told us to go from here. We have to do what she said. In a better world. Jensen clung to that idea. Her world had only anguish. She moved toward the door, doing as Sebastian said to do. He scanned in every direction. She simply followed, stepping over bodies, over bloody arms and legs. She was too scared to feel anymore, too heartsick to care. Her thoughts seemed completely muffled. She had always prided herself on her clear thinking. Where had her clear thinking gone? In the rain, he pulled her by her arm toward the path down. Betty, she said, digging in her heels. We have to get Betty. He gazed at the path, then toward the cave. I don't think we need bother with the goat, but I should get my pack, my things. She saw he was handing in the downpour without his cloak. He was soaked to the skin. It occurred to her that she wasn't the only one who wasn't thinking clearly. He was so intent on escaping that he almost left his things. That would be the death of him. She couldn't let him die. Betty would help. But there was one other thing that she remembered. Jensen ran back in the house. She ignored Sebastian's yell. Inside, she wasted no time rushing to a small wooden chest just inside the door. She looked at nothing else as she pulled out two bundled sheepskin cloaks, one hers, one her mother's. They kept them there, rolled and tied, at the ready, in case they ever had to leave in a hurry. He watched from the doorway, impatient, but silent, when he saw what she was doing. Without looking death in the eye, she rushed back out of her house for the last time. Together they ran to the cave. The fire was still crackling hot. Betty paced and trembled, but was uncharacteristically silent, as if knowing something was terribly wrong. Dry yourself in first, she said. We don't have time. We have to get out of here. The others could come at any moment. You'll freeze to death if you don't. Then what good will running do? Dan is dead. Her own reasoned words surprised her. Jensen pulled the two rolled sheepskin cloaks from under her wool cloak and started working loose the knots in the bar. These will help keep the rain out, but you need to get dry first, otherwise you won't stay warm enough. He was nodding as he shivered and rubbed his hands before the fire, the sense of what she said finally overcoming his urgency to be gone. She wondered how he managed to do all he had done with a fever, and after having taken herbs. Fear, she guessed. Stark raving fear. That she understood.
Her whole body ached. Not only had she been banged around, but she saw now that her shoulder was bleeding. The cut wasn't bad, but it throbbed. The sustained level of terror had left her drained and exhausted. She wanted only to lie down and cry, but her mother had told her to get away. Only her mother's words motivated her now. Without those last commands, Jensen would be unable to function. Now she simply did what her mother had told her to do. Betty was beside herself. The distraught goat tried to climb the pen to get to Jensen. As Sebastian hovered over the fire, Jensen tied a rope around Betty's neck. The goat was as thankful to be going as a goat could be. They would give Betty a chance to return the favor. When they had gotten away and found at least simple shelter, they would not be able to build a fire on such a wet night. If they could find a dry hole, a spot under a rock ledge or beneath fallen trees, they would hunker down beside the goat. Betty would keep them both warm so they wouldn't freeze to death. Jensen understood the plaintive calls Betty made toward the house. The goat's ears were at attention. Betty was worried for the woman who wasn't going. Jensen collected all the carrots and acorns off the shelf, stuffing them in pockets and packs. When Sebastian was as dry as he was going to allow himself to get, they donned their wool cloaks and topped them with the sheepskin. With Jensen leading Betty by the rope, they started out into the drenching darkness. Sebastian headed for the trail down from the front, the way he had come in. Jensen seized his arm, stopping him. They might be waiting down there. But we have to get out of here. I have a better way. We made an escape route. He gazed at her a moment through the fall of icy rain separating them, then, without further protest, followed her into the unknown. Chapter 7 Oba Schalk snatched the chicken by the neck and lifted it from the nest box. The chicken's head looked tiny above his meaty fist. With his other hand, he fished a warm brown egg from the bottom of the depression in the straw. He gently placed the egg in the basket with the others. Oba didn't set the chicken back down. He grinned as he lifted it closer to his face, watching its head twist from side to side, its beak open and close, open and close. He put his own lips close, so the beak was touching his lips, then with all his might, he blew in the chicken's open mouth. The chicken squawked and flapped, madly trying to escape the vice-like fist. A deep laugh rolled up from Oba's throat. Oba! Oba, where are you? When he heard his mother hollering for him, Oba plopped the chicken back on its nest. His mother's voice had come from the nearby barn. Squawking its terror, the chicken fled the henhouse. Oba followed it out of the coop and then trotted toward the door to the barn. The week before, they had had a rare winter downpour. By the following day, the standing water had frozen and the rain had turned to snow. Wind-swept snow now hid the ice, making for treacherous footing. Despite his size, Oba negotiated the icy conditions without much difficulty. Oba prided himself on being light on his feet. It was important for a person not to let their body or mind become slow and dull. Oba believed it was important to learn new things. He believed it was important to grow. He thought it was important for a person to use what they had learned. That was how people grew. The barn and house were one small structure made of wattle and daub, woven branches covered with a mixture of clay, straw, and dung. Inside, the house and barn were separated by a stone wall. After he'd built the house, Oba had made the wall inside by stacking flat gray rocks from the field. He had learned the technique from observing a neighbor stack rocks at the side of his field. The wall was a luxury most homes didn't have. Hearing his mother yell his name again, he tried to think of what he could have done wrong. As he perused his mental list of the chores she'd told him to do, he couldn't recall one in the barn that he'd failed to do. Oba wasn't forgetful, and besides, they were chores he did often. There shouldn't be anything in the barn to have set her off. True as all that was, none of it shielded him from incurring his mother's ire. She could think of things that needed doing that had never before needed doing. Oba! Oba! How many times do I need to call for you? In his mind's eye, he could see her mean little mouth all pinched up as she said his name, expecting him to appear the instant she screeched for him. The woman had a voice that could unwind a good rope. Oba turned sideways to fit his shoulders through the small side door into the barn. Rats squeaked and scurried away at his feet. The barn, with a hayloft above, housed their milk cow, two hogs, and two oxen. The cow was still in the barn. The hogs had been turned loose in the oak stand to rut for acorns under the snow. Oba could see the hind ends of both oxen through the larger barn door out to the yard on the other side. His mother stood on the low hill of frozen muck, hands on her hips, the cold smoke of her breath rising from her nostrils like a dragon's fiery snort. Mother was a big-boned woman, broad in the shoulders and hips, broad everywhere, even her forehead was broad. He had heard people say that when his mother was younger she had been a handsome woman, and indeed, when he had been a boy, she had had a number of suitors. Year by year, though, the struggles of life had worn away her looks, leaving behind deeply etched lines and sagging folds of flesh. The suitors had long ago stopped coming around. Oba made his way across the black icy ground inside the barn and stood before her, hands in his pockets. She walloped the side of his shoulder with a stout stick. Oba! He flinched when she whacked him three times more, each swat punctuating his name. Oba! 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 When he had been young, such a thrashing would have left him black and blue. He was too big and strong now for her stick to hurt him. That made her angry too. While he wasn't bothered much by the stick now that he was grown, the condemnation in her voice whenever she spoke his name still made his ears burn. She reminded him of a spider with a mean little mouth. A black widow spider. He hunched, trying not to look so big. What is it, Mama? Where are you loafing when your mother calls? Her face screwed up, a plum long ago turned to a prune. Over the ox, over the dimwit, over the oaf. Where were you? Oba lifted his arm defensively as she cracked him with the stick again. I was getting the eggs, Mom. Getting the eggs. Look at this mess. Don't it ever occur to you to do anything around here unless someone with brains tells you to? Oba looked around, but didn't see what needed doing other than the regular work that would have set her off so. There was always work to do. Rats stuck their noses out from under boards in the stalls, whiskers twitching as they sniffed, watching with beady black eyes, listening with little rat ears. He looked back at his mother but had no answer. None would suit her anyway. She pointed at the ground. Look at this place. Don't you ever think to scoop out the muck? Soon as it thaws, it'll be running under the wall and into the house where I sleep. 
Do you think I feed you for nothing? Don't you think you have to earn your keep, you lazy oaf? Oba the oaf? She had already used the last invective. Oba was surprised sometimes that she wasn't more creative, didn't learn new things. When he had been little, she had seemed to him a mind reader of inscrutable ability with a talented tongue that could cut him with knowing lashes. Now that he had grown so much larger than her, he sometimes wondered if other aspects of his mother were less formidable than he had once feared. Wondered if her power over him wasn't somehow artificial, an illusion, a scarecrow with a mean little mouth. Yet she still had a way about her that could cut him down to nothing. And she was his mother. A person was supposed to mind their mother. That was the most important thing a person could do. She had taught him that lesson well. Oba didn't think he could do much more to earn his keep. He worked from sun up to sundown. He prided himself on not being lazy. Oba was a man of action. He was strong and worked as hard as any two men. He could best any man he knew. Men didn't give him any trouble. Women, though, stymied him. He never knew what to do around women. Big as he was, women had a way of making him feel puny. He scuffed his boot against the dark, rippled, slick mound underfoot, assessing the rock-hard mass. The animals added to it continually, much of it freezing before it could all be scooped out, allowing it to build in layers throughout the long, cold winter. Periodically, Oba scattered straw over the top for better footing. He'd not want his mother to slip and fall. It wasn't long, though, before the layer of straw became slicked over, and it was time for another. But, Mama, the ground's all frozen. In the past, he had always scooped it out as it thawed and could be worked. In the spring, when it got warmer and the flies filled the barn with their constant buzzing, it would come off in layers where the straw was. But not now. Now it was welded together into a solid mass. Always an excuse, isn't that right, Oba? Always an excuse for your mother, you worthless bastard boy. She folded her arms, glowering at him. He couldn't hide from the truth, couldn't pretend, and she knew it. Oba peered around in the dark barn and saw the heavy steel scoop shovel leaning against the wall. I'll scoop it, Mama. You go back to your spinning and I'll scoop the barn good. He didn't exactly know how he was going to scoop the solid frozen muck, only that he had to. Get started now, she huffed. Use what light is left of the day. When it gets dark, then I want you to go to town to get me some medicine from Lathia. Now he knew why she had come to the barn looking for him. My knees is aching me again, she complained, as if she wanted to cut off any objection he might voice, even though he never did. He thought it, though. She always seemed to know what he was thinking. Today you can get started in the barn, and tomorrow you can go back to scraping the muck all
all the way down until you clean it all out. Before the day wears on, though, I want you to go get my medicine. Oba pulled on his ear as he cast his gaze toward the ground. He didn't like going to see Lathea, the woman with the cures. He didn't like her. She always looked at him like he was a worm. She was mean as rake. Worse, she was a sorceress. If Lathea didn't like someone, they suffered for it. Everybody was afraid of Lathea, so Oba didn't feel so singled out. Still, though, he didn't like going to see her. I will, Mama. I'll fetch your medicine. And don't you worry, I'll get to work at scraping the muck out, just like you said. I have to tell you every little thing, don't I, Oba? Her glare burned into him. I don't know why I bothered raising such a boss bastard boy, she added under her breath. Should have done what Lethea told me in the beginning. Oba heard her say this often when she was feeling sorry for herself, sorry that no suitors came around anymore, sorry that none had wanted to marry her. Oba was a curse she bore with bitter regret, a bastard child who'd brought her trouble from the first. If not for Oba, maybe she would have gotten herself a husband to provide for her. And don't you be staying in town with any foolishness. I won't, Mama. I'm sorry that your knees are bad today. She whacked him with the stick. They wouldn't be so bad if I didn't have to follow around a big gum ox seeing that he does what he should already be doing. Yes, Mama. Did you get the eggs? Yes, Mama. She eyed him suspiciously, then pulled a coin from her flaxen apron. Tell Lathea to make up a remedy for you too, along with my medicine. Maybe we can get rid you of the keeper's evil. If we could get the evil out of you, maybe you wouldn't be so worthless. His mother, from time to time, sought to purge him of what she believed to be his evil nature. She tried all sorts of potions. When he was little, she had often forced him to drink burning powder she mixed with soapy water. Then she would lock him in a pen in the barn, hoping the otherworldly evil wouldn't like being burned, and locked up both, and would flee his restrained earthly body. His pen didn't have slats like the pens for the animals did. It was made of solid boards. In the summer, it was an oven. 
When she made him take burning powder and then dragged him by the arm and locked him in the pen, he near to died of terror that she'd never let him out or never let him have a drink of water. He welcomed the beatings she would give him to try to silence his screams just to be let out. You buy my medicine from Lathea and a remedy for you. His mother held up the small silver coin as her eyes narrowed into a spiteful squint. And don't you go wasting any of this on women. Oba felt his ears heating. Each time his mother sent him to buy something, whether medicine or letterwork or pottery or supplies, she always admonished him not to waste the money on women. He knew that when she told him not to waste it on women, she was mocking him. Oba didn't have the courage to say much of anything to women. He always bought what his mother said to buy. He never once wasted it on anything. He feared his mother's wrath. He hated that she always told him not to waste the money when he never did. It made him feel like he thought he was intending to do wrong even though he wasn't. It made him guilty even though he had done no wrong. It made what was in his thoughts, even if he didn't have them, a crumb. He tugged on a burning ear. I won't waste it, Mama. And dress respectable, not like some dumb ox. You already reflect badly enough on me. I will, Mama, you see. Oba ran around to the house and fetched his felt cap and brown woolen jacket for his journey to Breton, a couple miles northwest. She watched him carefully hang them on a peg, where they would stay clean until he was ready to go to town. With the scoop shovel, he started in on the rock-hard muck. The steel shovel rang like a bell each time he rammed it at the frozen ground. He grunted with each mighty blow. Chips of black ice burst forth, splattering his trousers. Each was but an infinitesimal speck from the dark mountain of muck. It was going to take a long time and a lot of work. He didn't mind hard work. Time to get his Mother watched from the doorway of the barn for a few minutes to make sure he was working up a sweat as he chipped away at the frozen mound. When she was satisfied, she vanished from the doorway to go back to her own work, leaving him to think about his coming visit to Lathea. Oba. Oba paused. The rats back in the small places still. Their little black rat eyes watched him watching them. The rats went back to their search for food. Oba listened for the familiar voice. He heard the door to the house close. Mother, a spinster, was going back to spinning her wool. Mr. Tuckman brought her wool, which she spun into thread for him to use on his loom. The meager pay helped support her and her bastard son. Oba. Oba knew the voice well. He'd heard it ever since he could remember. He never told his mother about it. She would be angry and think that it was the keeper's evil calling to him. She would want to force him to swallow even more potions and cures. He was too big to be locked in the pen anymore, but he wasn't too big to drink Lathea's cures. When one of the fat rats scurried past, Oba stepped on its tail, trapping it. Oba. The rat squeaked a little rat squeak. Little rat legs scrambled, trying to get away. Little rat claws scratched against the black ice. Oba reached down and seized the fat furry body. He peered at the whiskered face. The head twisted futilely. Beady black eyes watched him. Those eyes were filled with fear. Surrender. Oba thought it was vitally important to learn new things. Quick as a fox, he bit off the rat's head. Chapter 8 From what seemed to her the least troublesome corner of the room, Jensen kept an eye on the door as well as the boisterous crowd. Half a room away, Sebastian leaned on the thick wooden plank counter, speaking to the innkeeper. She was a big woman, and with a forbidding scowl that made her look like she was as used to trouble as she was prepared to deal with it. The room full of people, mostly men, were a jovial lot. Some of the men played at dice or other table games, some arm wrestled. Most were drinking and telling jokes that would set tables of them off in peals of fist-pounding laughter. Laughter sounded obscene to Jensen. There was no joy in her world. There could be none. The past week was a blur. Or was it more than a week? She couldn't recall exactly how long they had been traveling. What did it matter? What did anything matter? Jensen was unaccustomed to people. People had always represented danger to her. Groups of them made her nervous. People at an inn, drinking and gambling, even more so. When men noticed her standing at the end of the counter near the wall, they forgot the jokes or paused at their dice and lingered on the sight of her. Meeting their gazes, she pushed the hood of her cloak back, letting her thick rings of red hair fall over the front of her shoulders. That was enough to turn their eyes back to their own business. Jensen's red hair spooked people, especially those who were superstitious. Red hair was uncommon enough that it raised suspicion. It gave people a worry that she might be gifted, or perhaps that she might even be a witch. Jensen, by boldly meeting their gazes, played on such fears. It had in the past helped protect her, oftentimes better than a knife could have. Back at her house, it hadn't helped one little bit. After the men turned away from her and went back to their dice and drinks, Jensen looked back down the counter. The stout innkeeper was staring at her, at her red hair. When Jensen met her gaze, the woman quickly turned her attention back to Sebastian. He asked her another question. She bent closer as she spoke to him. Jensen couldn't hear them over the roar of all the talking, joking, betting, cheering, cursing, and laughing. Sebastian nodded to the woman's words, spoken close to his ear. She pointed off over the heads of her customers, apparently giving directions. Sebastian straightened and pulled a coin from his pocket, then slid it across the counter toward the woman. After taking the coin, she traded it for a key from a box behind her. Sebastian scooped the key off the counter worn smooth by countless mugs and hands. He picked up his own mug and bid the woman a good day. When he reached the end of the counter, he leaned close to Jensen so she could hear him and gestured with his mug. You sure you wouldn't like a drink? Jensen shook her head. He kept an eye on the room full of people. They were all once again engaged in their own business. It was a good thing you pushed your hood back. Until the woman of the house saw that red hair of yours, she was playing dumb. After that, her tongue loosened. The woman knows her? She is still living here in Gretton, as my mother said? The innkeeper is sure? Sebastian took a long drink, watching a roll of dice bring a cheer for the winner. She gave me directions. And you got us rooms? Only one room. As he took another swig, he saw her reaction. Better to be together in case of trouble. I thought it would be safer with us both in one room. I'd rather sleep with...